Can you imagine your community paying for half of your wedding? Will you, your parents, or your grandparents live in a nursing home or retirement community? Inconceivable. If there are 500 or 1,000 people at your funeral, you must be pretty important, right? Nope, not in Mexico. On this episode of Everything Mexico, we will talk about family and community. Yo no me atrevo a bailar arriba de esa tarima. Yo no me atrevo a bailar arriba de esa tarima. Con esas bailadoras que vuelan con cada rima. Con esas bailadoras que vuelan con cada rima. Yo no me atrevo a bailar arriba de esa tarima. Yo no me Welcome to another episode of Everything Mexico. I am your host, Richard. When I married Daisy, my Mexican wife, in Mexico, I thought I was going to have to pay for almost all the expenses. Then, my mother-in-law, Patty, started talking to relatives and friends and capitalizing upon the cultural norm of godparents for weddings. One friend offered to be the godmother of table settings, yet another, the godmother of music. Another, the godfather of champagne. And yet another, the godmother of flowers. In Spanish, godmother is madrina and godfather is padrino. Your godparents are your padrinos. When a woman becomes a godmother of flowers, for example, she then takes on the responsibility of providing the flowers for the wedding. When a man takes on the responsibility of being the godfather, say of champagne, then he's responsible for bringing the champagne to the wedding. But one by one, people started becoming godparents and helping us. We would ride horses at a friend's house and he offered to organize a horse parade with mariachi to come across town, pick up Daisy at her house, and continue on to the farm where we're going to have the ceremony. On the day of the wedding, I dressed up as a charro, a Mexican cowboy, and met them in the park on the far side of town. Everyone rode straight down Main Street with the mariachis playing all the way to Daisy's house. With great fanfare, with music and flowers, among the horses, the charro gala, the mariachis playing. We picked up Daisy at her mom's house. Daisy had an escaramuza dress on, which is a formal dress for Mexican cowgirls. And we proceeded to ride across town to the farm where the ceremony was going to be held. Some people I knew very well, others not so well, yet many were helping in so many ways. It was a very pleasant but shocking experience. I had never seen so many people who weren't being paid work so hard together for a wedding. A friend of ours at a hardware store lent us wire so we could string lights to go over the tables and chairs. Others put in long hours to create beautiful yarn balls that work so well as colorful spherical shades for these lights. Others provided tables for the food and gifts, yet others lent vehicles to move the many things needed for the ceremony. The folk dance troupe that Daisy belonged to came with all their attire and performed various choreographies from different parts of Mexico. We invited about 300 people, but we guess in the end about 400 came. You don't need an invitation to come to celebrations in Mexico. So as a host, it's always best to have a lot more food and chairs than you think you'll need. Your guest list is just your starting point. So many people came that while we had prepared a huge pig that dressed weighed over 300 pounds, by the time I wanted to have some, it was gone. Fortunately, we had also prepared about 250 pounds of sheep. But eating is an afterthought when you host such a large celebration, so it really didn't matter. I was in awe at the magnitude of the community response. It turned out to be a huge event with more beauty, dance, music, and pomp than I had ever imagined. The love ceremony was truly a sensational experience that tops the list as the best community experience I've ever had. You knew your family expected you to become independent when you finished high school or college. Even if your parents never explicitly said so, you know it's true. It's a societal norm that's pretty well outlined to most. In Mexico, not so. For most, there is no real expectation that you will move out and become independent. The contrary, many parents want their children to be around, so they actively discourage them from moving out. So many young people stay at home living with their parents well into their 20s and 30s. And even if they have moved out, they often move back in. Underlying your life in Mexico is the understanding that family comes first. And I really mean first. If your sister needs a place to stay, you offer up your house. If your aunt has fallen on hard financial times, you offer up your house. It seems a bit odd to me now to see how relatives are sometimes hardly welcome at your house in the United States, and they're almost always most definitely not welcome to live in your house. It now seems so strangely foreign. In Mexico, you can basically show up at a relative's house anytime, any day, and you will be welcomed with open arms for as long as you desire. Mexicans say, 
Mi casa es tu casa. In English, my house is your house. And it's not a meaningless phrase like saying, how you doing in English, and not really waiting for an answer. Family First will follow you throughout your life in Mexico. You won't go to a nursing home in your old age. Family will give you home care when you are ill. And if you fall on tough financial times, you'll have a place to live. Dedicated love of family and true community makes bullying a subject of jokes in Mexico. Mexicans are sometimes aware of bullying in the U.S. through social media like Facebook and YouTube, but they generally make fun of it because Mexican youth rarely face true bullying. Sure, they make fun of each other, sometimes get into fights, but having a lot of family around and living in strong communities, they tend to care for each other a lot more than is the case in some societies. In my 15 years teaching elementary school, middle school, and high school age students in Mexico, I only heard first-handedly of one case of extreme bullying. After living in Mexico for a total of 17 years, 24-7, 365 days a year, and being very close with the community around me, I conclude that much of the verbal and physical violence among youth in the United States and some other countries is due to lack of family and community. If you don't feel that people love you and you are anonymous, how can you feel like an important and integral part of society and love others? If you are enjoying everything Mexico, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. It helps us a lot and we really appreciate it. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, we'll leave a link in the description below. Almost everything that's good has a bad side. Being so closely integrated into the life of those around you, there's a lot of peer pressure to conform. So Mexican society is quite traditional and real change is slow. Mexicans often learn how to manage money well quite late in life. They almost always have family to fall back on and don't necessarily need to be very responsible with their resources. Another con to such closely knit families is that they often become clan-like siding with relatives against non-relatives when there are disagreements and conflicts regardless of who is right and wrong. Family unity is often more important than making decisions based on ethics. Thus, there is often considerable injustice simply because some people don't look beyond bloodlines and try to extend a hand out to come to a peaceful resolution. Having such closely knit families plays a very important role in the birth and care of children. It often works out that grandparents, and especially grandmothers, take care of their grandchildren. Many Mexicans become parents when they are in their teens and young 20s, so they're often little more than kids themselves and have no idea how to be parents. They leave the parenting to their parents and grandparents, so there's often a generational gap. At this point, you may be imagining a gray-haired woman taking care of babies, but because some people become grandparents at such a young age, they are often grandparents when they are in their 30s and 40s. Think about this. If you become a mother or father at the age of 16, and your son or daughter becomes a mother or father at the age of 16, then you will be a grandparent at the age of 32. And you could very well become a great-grandmother or great-grandfather in your 40s. This happens in part because families are so close and so supportive. This was very shocking to me at first because it was so different from the culture that I grew up in in the northeastern United States. If a teenage girl becomes pregnant in Mexico, the parent's initial reaction is often, what did you do? Followed by, it's a gift from God. Es un regalo de Dios. Then the family helps out providing a home, material resources, and care. This is one of the reasons why family size is still relatively large in Mexico. There is no dire incentive to postpone childbearing until later in life. Can you imagine being 20 and thinking you are old? Many Mexican girls celebrate their quinceaños, or pink party as many call it in English, due to the fact that many of the girls wear pink dresses during the celebration. It is a celebration of womanhood. Womanhood starts much younger in Mexico than in the United States, Canada, Europe, and many other places. One of the results is that many Mexican women start feeling old much younger than many foreigners would. The idea of a 25-year-old Canadian feeling old sounds rather ridiculous. But many Mexican women feel they are past their prime and on the downhill slope at this age. It sounds crazy, but they really do. Many want to be 15 forever, maybe not in mind, but at least in body. I've reflected upon this quite a bit over the years as it strikes me as quite odd. Why would 15 be seen as the ideal age? And it's only for women, not for men. I don't definitively know the answer, but I have a few thoughts on the matter. Physical beauty is idealized in Mexico, and many young Mexican girls dress very sexy, much sexier than many cultures would find appropriate, especially at their age. Sexuality permeates Mexican society in a way that is unthinkable in many other places. If you may be a mother in your mid or late teens or early 20s, then the time previous to that is when society perceives you to be your sexiest and most physically attractive. In modern times, with much of Mexico eating a Western and much less healthy diet, the mid-teens is often when people look their healthiest. 
As they move into their late teens and 20s, obesity becomes more prevalent and fitness tends to decline. Additionally, while people don't want to talk about the subject much, Mexico is still extremely chauvinistic. Women often depend upon men, as many of the men control the better paying jobs and opportunities. If you are a beautiful and young woman, your opportunities for access to power and resources is greater. Power is beauty the world over, especially in Mexico. I'll cover more on the topic of sexuality and beauty in a future episode. Because communities are so closely knit, they perform a self-policing role. As law enforcement authorities often play a minimal role or no role at all in the actual policing of communities, communities often watch over themselves and dole out justice as they see fit in so much as they are motivated to do so. You often see signs on houses making it clear there's a community organization watching. If someone steals or does something that harms someone, there will be consequences. And often these punishments are quite harsh. Opportunistic thievery is quite common in Mexico. Sometimes communities get fed up and take justice into their own hands. They often completely mistrust the authorities, knowing that the very people who are supposed to protect them are sometimes involved in the community's crimes. The fact that everyone knows almost everyone else makes it much more difficult to be an anonymous thief or criminal. People in the community talk to each other all the time, and word spreads fast. There are few secrets for long. I have noticed that in the United States, it often takes people a long time to get over the death of a loved one. While it is usually difficult to overcome the death of someone close to you, the tightly knit community in Mexico makes this assimilation much easier. The street in front of your house will be closed off, a tent will be erected, seats will be put out, almost everyone that knew that person will start to show up, bringing food, money, love, hugs. The support that people receive after the death of a loved one is truly spectacular. Hundreds of people will show up at the funeral of just your average Joe. People often start showing up in the late afternoon and they will stay there until late into the night or early into the next morning. This outpouring of support makes the tragedy of death play out in a different way. After having lived in a very individualistic society in the United States and a very family-oriented society in Mexico, I believe that neither to the extreme is desirable. Mexico's family-focused society benefits us in many ways, making people feel very loved and included. The U.S. society I grew up in made me very self-sufficient and productive due to the need to be independent. Either to the extreme is harmful. I reflect upon some of the problems facing the U.S. now. Opioid crisis, general addictions, bullying, suicide, loneliness, shootings, and there is no doubt in my mind that many of these problems stem from the fact that families are living in different houses, towns, cities. Often, even neighbors don't know one another. People move to follow work and other opportunities and are strangers to most of those around them. This separation leads to isolation. Instead of spending time with loved ones, many are addicted to their screen time smartphones, tablets, TVs, computers, and are being fed information from sites that match their previous screen time, perpetuating sameness. Families, while alike in some ways, have many differences in the personality and character of each member. When family members spend time with one another, rather than being alone and or their attention glued to a screen, these differences in character and personality lead to exchanges that break the self-perpetuating loop that so much of social media leads us into. Healthy people have strong relationships in family and community, and Mexico has a lot to teach us about these relationships. If you have any topics you would like me to cover regarding Mexico, please put them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching the Everything Mexico channel, and I hope to see you on the next episode.